The title of our sermon this morning is God for us. God for us. The primary text is Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 39, and we're going to get there. We'll look at several texts this morning as we study in our ongoing series entitled The Essentials, uh, the subject of God's providence. The subject of God's providence. Now, our aim in this series is essentially one sermon, one hour, one fundamental or foundational subject, uh, introducing each of those subjects that we believe to be essential in the growth and development of someone new to the faith or someone considering membership in our church. Uh, We're attempting in that course of study called the Essentials to follow the general course of our Confession of Faith, the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. And so, in following the course of our confession, we began with a series on the doctrine of revelation. We have subsequently been working through theology proper, or the doctrine of God. And in our look together at theology proper, we've considered the Trinity. We've considered the attributes of God, the person and work of the Father. Last week, we introduced God's originating work in creation. And this week, we now come to introduce God's continuing work through providence. Through providence. At chapter 5, Article 1 in our Confession of Faith introduces the providence of God in this way. God is the good creator of all things. In His infinite power and wisdom, He does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things from the greatest even to the least by His most wise and holy providence to the end for which they were created according to His infallible foreknowledge and the free and immutable counsel of His own will to the praise of the glory of His wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. In other words, God sustains, directs, and governs all of His creation by His providence for His glory. God's own providence is the means then by which God directs all things to their decreed end. And we've learned that according to Scripture, we've learned from the Bible, that God decrees all things whatsoever that come to pass. That is enveloping in its scope, expansive in its scope. God decrees all things whatsoever that come to pass. He works all things after the counsel of His own will. So if we think of then... The decree of God as the blueprint, and understanding last week from creation that creation is the work site, then providence is the work of God as it unfolds in time and space. That work done to execute the blueprint, so to speak, to bring about all that God has decreed for His own glory. It is the sovereign, divine superintendence of all things, working them all to their decreed end. This is the doctrine of providence. The Baptist Catechism asks the question, what are God's works of providence? The answer, God's works of providence are His most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all His creatures and all their actions. It's expansive in its scope, isn't it? expansive in its scope. The word providence comes from a Latin word meaning to provide before, to provide before or to provide with foresight, right? To provide with foresight. It's the the same Latin participle from which we derive our English word provision. Our word provision comes from that word, the same Latin root, same Latin verb for providence. It means provision or seeing before. Right? Provision. That's not passive, as in mere seeing, but it's very active. Uh, We can think of the root verb as acts of providing for a future need or a future goal. I see what's coming and I provide for what's coming. Uh, You determine, for example, to be here this morning for worship. You had to make provision to do that. If you're coming to worship this morning, you're going to be here on time or late. You're going to be here by making provision to be here. Right? Then seeing before what would come. You made provision to be here. In other words, you got dressed. Uh, Some of you, some of you fixed your hair this morning. (laughs) Some of you may have brushed your teeth before you came. (laughs) 
You drove your car and you came to church. You made provision, pro seeing before, vision, provision to come to church. Now, we're introduced to this Hebrew word that conveys this, con- this sense or this uh, concept in Genesis chapter 22. Turn there with me to Genesis chapter 22 and look there beginning in verse 1. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. God's providence sovereignly and totally, entirely operative in creation even before this point. But in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, we're introduced to the Hebrew word that's used to convey the sense of what providence is through an example, through an illustration given to us, an account in Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham encounters a test of his faith, and we see Abraham's faith in action. Look at verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then God said in verse 2, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So now, Verse 1, Abraham receives the audible command from God. He hears God speaking audibly to him. God, the creator of heaven and earth, speaking to Abraham. The one who has given us life, the one who holds our lives in his hands, the one for whom, through whom, and to whom we exist, the one who has the right to do with us as he pleases. And so, having heard that command from God, Abraham, verse 3, rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abraham trusted God, right? Abraham was given a command. It was a difficult command, right? Difficult. Abraham, though, trusted the Lord. In this sense, in this account, unflinchingly, unhesitatingly. He arose early in the morning. Abraham believed God and he set out to do what God had commanded. He knew that God had promised through Isaac and he knew that God will fulfill all that he had promised through Isaac. It was through the seed of Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Right? Abraham trusted God for that promise. He knew that God would certainly bring about all of his promised will through Isaac and God would absolutely keep His word. Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 19, says that Abraham had concluded that God was able to raise Isaac up even from the dead. Right? Abraham, though, trusts God. He trusts God. So, verse 4, On the third day, as they were traveling, right, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. We know that he's in the, the southern area of Jerusalem or Judea at that time because he, he uses the word yonder. So it's a South Israel thing. It's a joke. You guys aren't laughing. You've just failed miserably. I will go yonder. It's interesting to find the word yonder in Scripture, but there it is. So he goes, uh, I will go yonder with the lad. We're going to worship, and we're going to come back to you. Verse 6, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, he laid it on, his, on Isaac, his son. He took fire in his hand, a knife, and the two of them went together. He took fire in his hand and a knife. Isaac, verse 7, then spoke to Abraham, his father, and he said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son... Yahweh Ra'a, Yahweh Ra'a, God will provide. My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so the two of them went together. Before we get our understanding, our word, our transliteration, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. God is in control. God is directing the circumstances. God is sovereign over the whole situation. He will make provision for what He has determined. The Hebrew verb there literally means that God will see. God will see. 
And what the Lord foresees, He has decreed. And the Lord will provide for, or the Lord will bring about what He has determined to bring to pass. That conveys the meaning of providence. That conveys the meaning of providence. Now we know the account. God did work through providence to provide for what He had decreed. Let me ask you, was it simply by chance that there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns? Was it simply a coincidence that Abraham glances out of the corner of his eye, he sees a ram, he really doesn't want to sacrifice Isaac, he sees the ram caught by its horns, coincidence that there's a ram there, just by chance, so to speak, when Abraham is ready to sacrifice Isaac? No. No. God, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, will bring about what He has decreed to come to pass, and He has made provision for the burnt offering. So verse 14, drop down to verse 14. In verse 14, Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Ra'ah. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God, through His providence, provides. Right? God in His providence provides. Provides for what He decrees. Provides for what He has decreed to come to pass. For what He ordains should come to pass. All things, according to the counsel of His own will, God provides for all of them to come to pass according to His Word. To the greater glory of God's gracious providence, this account in Genesis 22 foreshadows a greater provision, doesn't it? Foreshadows the greater provision of God for a full and final burnt offering, so to speak. For a full and final sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice of His own Son on the mount of the Lord. And where Abraham was called to restrain his hand, that God, in grace and mercy to us, would not. Through all the history, through all the history that would span these two events, it would be on this very mountain, Genesis 22, that God the Father would offer up His only begotten Son as as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of His people. On this mountain where in unspeakable love our Heavenly Father would not spare His own Son, but would freely deliver Him up for us all. So that we might die to sin in Him and be raised to everlasting life. Such a simple but profound illustration of God's infinitely wise and immeasurably powerful work through providence. You know, just the bookends of those two events, right? God providing such a simple way, calling Abraham, making a covenant with Abraham, and then calling Abraham to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his own son. Through all the history that spans between that covenant that he made with Abraham and God delivering up his own son on the same mountain to die for the sins of his people, all that history, God working sovereignly in complete and entire crushing control over everything that comes to pass to bring about inviolably, inextricably to bring about His promises, His word to save His people. It is the glory, a glorious testament to God's providence. Before the foundation of the world, God decrees all things that are to come to pass. My days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. He creates the heavens, creates the earth, all that is in them, and then knowing exactly what is needed, He works continuously to provide for His creation and to sustain His creation to its decreed end. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 describes God as upholding all things by the word of His power. What God creates, God sustains and God preserves. Now this describes far more than a mere foreknowledge or a mere knowledge of what will happen in the future. This is far more than God simply knowing what will come. Far more than God simply foreseeing those things which will come to pass. What does God Himself reveal about His own knowledge of these things? God says this in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. He says, I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like Me. What? Declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring it. 
to be so, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. And this is his providence. Verse 11, calling a bird of prey from the east, calling the man who executes my counsel from a far country, indeed I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. That's providence. I have purposed, God said, I also will do it. So then, what is the response that God calls for? In light of that glorious knowledge of what God does in history, what God does through His providence, working in time and space to bring about all things that God has called to happen, decreed to come to pass, what does the Lord say? Verse 12, He says, listen to me, you stubborn hearted. <laughs> listen to me, you stubborn hearted who are far from righteousness. I will bring my righteousness near to you. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger, and I will place salvation in Zion, as the psalmist says, on my holy hill. For Israel, my glory. I think what, what great consolation that is for those who are the spiritual seed of Abraham through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That God will bring that to pass. God doesn't merely know the future. God doesn't merely see what's going to happen. God knows the future because God has decreed the future. And He will absolutely bring about that which He has decreed, and He does that through His providence. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. The Lord Jesus Christ was delivered up by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Not just the foreknowledge of God, but the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Everything that God foresees, God decrees. Do you see? There's not mere foreknowledge. It's not just raw foresight or telling the future. Whatever God foresees, God has decreed. It's according to that determined purpose that Peter then says, You, he's delivered up Christ, whom you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. In other words, God's purpose isn't lawless. Think with me. God's purpose was not lawless. Their hands were lawless. And God is in no way the author of sin, but God's providence extends even over the sinful actions of His creatures. That most grievous, most heinous of all sins, the mock trial and scourging, crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, worked through lawless, wicked hands God brought about for the ultimate good and for the glory of His own name. Considering the scope of God's providence, the Lord Himself says in Matthew chapter 10, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's foreknowledge. Is that what it says? <laughs> no. Not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's foresight. Is that what it says? No. Not one of those sparrows falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Apart from your father's will. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Do you see? And listen, that's no less an amazing fact, even though the numbers of your head, the hairs of your head, may be decreasing. Or if you don't have any. It's still an amazing fact, right? And in Matthew 10... What's the implication of this staggering truth for those who have put their faith in Him? What's the implication? The Lord says there, Do not fear, therefore. Do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Listen, if God is in control, God is working through His providence to bring all things that He has decreed to come to pass, and He's caring for us. We know from Romans 8, He works all things together for our good. Then don't worry. What are we worrying about? Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, Matthew 6, 32, the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So then, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. The Heidelberg Catechism 
describes God's providence this way. I like this. It says, The Almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were by His hand, He upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things come, not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. That's nice, isn't it? There's no such thing as chance. No such thing as fortune or fate or luck. But rather, the sovereign superintendence of our Heavenly Father. Luck or chance or fate is a denial of God. This world wants to assign things to luck, right? Just a run of bad luck, run of good luck, right? That's your destiny, that's just fate. Fate is a denial of God. The Bible says that in Him we live and move and have our being. Don't be influenced by the pagan worldview of this culture. We need to recognize the pagan influence of this culture when we hear such things. When it rains, it's because God brought the rain, <laughs> right? It used to be that that's the way that people spoke. And especially if you read your Bible, that's the way that they thought. They had a biblical worldview of God superintending, providentially governing all things that come to pass. And so when it rained, God brought the rain. If there was a harvest, God brought the harvest. If there was no harvest, God denied us a harvest. And why would that be? When there is adversity, it's because God has brought the adversity. I remember years ago on the news, I was old enough to remember, when the AIDS epidemic started, and there was someone in particular on the news who raised up and said, this is the judgment of God against sin. It's the judgment of God against sin. And this world railed against that. Absolutely lost their minds for someone to actually assert that God might exert His providence, His sovereign control in time and space to judge the sinful actions of men. It was absolutely foreign, abhorrent to this world that someone might assert that that was the case. Listen, God controls all things whatsoever that come to pass through His providence. If there is adversity, God has done it. The Lord says, if there is calamity, have not I, the Lord, done it? <laughs> this world replaces God with chance. This world replaces God with Mother Nature. Replaces God with the laws of nature and the like. They go through difficulty and it's just a run of bad luck. Things happen by accident. <laughs> no, no, no such thing. The Scriptures are clear unvarnished, unflinching, unapologetic. The Bible does not mince words. This is not shadowy. It's not doubtful. It's not up for debate. The Bible is clear. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. And He is in sovereign control. It amazes me. With, and often it's with people who profess to be Christians. That I'm sitting down with a Bible, and the Bible says it's A, B, C, and they want to say it's X, Y, Z. <laughs> Listen, there is, it's not up for debate. It is clear. The Scriptures, if you're going to believe in them, the Scriptures state unequivocally that our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. He is in sovereign control. He is working all things according to the counsel of His own decreed and immutable will. His sovereign providential control extends to nature, extends to nations, Extends even to the decisions and actions of men. Even the sinful decisions and actions of men. From the smallest of microscopic particles to the largest of galaxies in the expanse of this universe, God is in control. This is the doctrine of God's providence. Now for the remainder of our time together this morning, I want to show you from texts in the Bible providence exemplified. Providence exemplified. I want to give you examples from the Bible. Through those examples of God's providence in the Bible, we want to look at providence explained. How does it work uh, from what is revealed to us in the Bible? What does it involve? And we'll conclude this introduction with providence experienced. Providence exemplified in the text, 
providence explained as we go, providence experienced in the life of the believer. There are examples all over the Bible. The Bible, you could say, from cover to cover, is an example of God's providence in history. But for our purposes this morning, turn with me now to Genesis chapter 50. A few pages to the right, Genesis chapter 50, in what is a classic passage, a locus classicus for providence in the Bible, a quintessential text for teaching or for observing God's work through providence. Look at Genesis chapter 50 and look down at verse 15. Now, for context here in Genesis chapter 50, because of envy, the sons of Jacob, the brothers of Joseph, have plotted Joseph's demise. We know the story, right? They sold Joseph into slavery, covered his coat with the blood of a goat, and then lied to their father about what had happened to him. They had first intended to murder him before Reuben steps in and stops the murder. They then d- decide to perpetrate this lie to their grieving father that Joseph was killed by an animal. So they sold Joseph into slavery. Joseph winds up in Egypt, where then Joseph, through the providence of God, rises to power, second only to Pharaoh in the kingdom. And that's when God, through His providence, brings a great famine on the land. Through the providence of God, Joseph is then reconciled to his father, reconciled to his brothers, and now Jacob, his father, has died. Look at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph now will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Notice, they did evil. Right? They did evil against Joseph. They did evil to Jacob. They perpetrated evil in this circumstance. Right? So verse 16, they sent messengers to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now consider with me, it was their trespass, their sin, their evil. They've committed this moral wrong, this trespass, freely. They've done that according to their own mind, according to their own will. They've freely chosen to act in this way, and they are morally responsible. They're going to be held accountable before God. It is their trespass, their sin, their evil, right? Now, verse 17, the end of the verse. Now, please forgive the trespass of the servants of God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went, fell down before his face, and they said to Joseph, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, verse 19, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? That's interesting, isn't it? That's a rhetorical question. The intended answer is absolutely not. Joseph is not in the place of God. But Joseph is making a statement about his role in the whole affair, verse 19, right? Joseph is saying essentially, listen, I am just a means. I'm a means. I'm not an end here. I'm not God. I am God's servant. I'm God's slave. I'm God's instrument. I am a means through which God has accomplished His purpose. He doesn't see Himself as an end. He's a means. He's a secondary cause, you could say. Now listen, you remember once that Moses did the opposite of this in the wilderness. Remember with me, okay? Moses got fed up with the grumbling and complaining Israelites, and he acted as though he himself wielded power and judgment over them, as if he were the one in charge, as if he were God, so to speak. And he struck the rock in anger rather than obeying God and speaking to it as God had commanded, And having struck the rock in anger, having taken this role upon himself, as if he were to say, I am in the place of God to you, Moses died before he entered the promised land. Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land because he did this in the wilderness before the children of Israel. Joseph here does exactly the opposite. His brothers come to him when Joseph could have said, I am going to rain down fire and brimstone on you for all you've done to me, right? And sought revenge, so to speak. Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph doesn't do that. Do not be afraid, he said to them, for am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? 
Joseph understands God's providence. God is accomplishing his decreed will, and I am simply a means to his ends. Do you see? If you think about that, that will change your perspective on life. The way that you view everything changes. I heard one say, it's like a Copernican revolution in your mind. A Copernican revolution. You remember, Copernicus was one who thought that, or people originally thought, that all the universe revolved around the earth. Everything revolved around the earth. The Copernican revolution was when they found out that no, <laughs> that our solar system, including the earth, revolves around the sun. It just like changed the way that everybody thought about the universe. Now this, if you can think of yourself as a means rather than an end, it'll change the way that you think about everything. That's important. We'll talk about that more as we go. So now, Joseph then further clarifies this in verse 20. Knowing God's providence, knowing His place in the providential working of God, Joseph says in verse 20, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is to this day to save many people alive. That's the, that's the lesson of the story, the account of Joseph. That's the lesson, you could say, that we're, just, we're supposed to take away from this account. That's amazing, amazing to me. We sit in the audience, so to speak. We sit in the audience, so to speak, and watch the divine masterpiece played upon the stage of history, and we come to understand something of the providential work of our gracious and good God. We stand back and watch it as it takes place on the stage of history in the account of Joseph and his brothers right here in Egypt. And for all the apparent chaos that there looks to be in this world, for all of the evil, for all of the wickedness of fallen men, for all of these things that have taken place, the wickedness of his brothers, the famine that's come upon, him, upon the land, the very life of Joseph going into Potiphar's house, being imprisoned, and then finding himself as second to Pharaoh, all of this that apparently looks like chance and coincidence and fate, chaos, so to speak, this is all the work of our gracious and good God. God is at sovereign work through divine providence to bring all things to their God-glorifying and therefore good end. God is bringing about all of these circumstances for His good purposes. The serpent in the garden meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Now think about that. What the serpent meant for evil, God meant for good. That's so far out of the realm of just foresight or foreknowledge, isn't it? What the serpent meant for evil, God meant it for good. <laughs> what Pharaoh, what Pharaoh meant for evil, God meant for good. What Judas meant for evil, God meant for good. Here, the brothers of Joseph intended evil against him, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Concerning God's providence, this is called the doctrine of concurrence. The doctrine of concurrence. There's a confluence, a convergence, if you will. There are two rivers that converge into one in verse 20. Two rivers that converge into one in verse 20. There is a confluence of intentions, a confluence of purposes, right? Think with me. The brothers sinned. They hated they plotted, they devised, they reasoned within themselves, they determined their course of action, and they acted, intending to do evil against Joseph. They acted freely, and they acted, therefore, morally responsible for their actions, and they are ultimately accountable to God for all of their actions. And, <laughs> and God has decreed and God has determined. And God has acted freely. And acting freely, God has directed all this according to His 
own will. The brothers of Joseph, though acting freely, we would have to say we're not acting alone. Can you see? God was acting in and through their choice to bring about His decreed purpose. He was working even in and through their sin. In mind, it's their sin. Their wicked intentions, their wicked aims, their wicked actions. Now, that does not mean, that does not mean that God is the author of evil. We know that God is not the author of sin. God neither tempts, is not tempted, nor does he tempt anyone to sin. James makes that very clear. But it does mean that God is sovereign, and God is sovereign even over sin. Their intent was Joseph's destruction. God's intention was the salvation of many lives. Isn't that interesting? Right? It's fascinating how God works through providence. Their intention was Joseph's death. God's intention was the salvation of many lives. The activity of God and the activity of man converge. It's called the doctrine of concurrence. And from that, what's interesting, from that convergence, it is the will of God that is accomplished. It's the will of God that is accomplished. Dutch reformer Willemus Abrackel says it's not, we're not to think of this like two horses pulling a wagon. Like the two horses are side by side and they're pulling a wagon down the pathway, right? It's not like two horses pulling a wagon. Instead, God permeates, works in all secondary causes and their motions to a conclusive effect. God works in all of it to bring about His end. It's amazing. That is the mystery of the doctrine of providence. How God does that is a mystery. There are many things in the Bible that we will simply not understand. <laughs> we can't understand. Listen, if there's something in the Bible that we simply cannot, we are not meant to understand because God has not revealed how He does it, listen, that's okay. <laughs> We're responsible to understand everything that we can. I've, I've talked to people, I'm sure you have too before, if you've witnessed for any length of time, talk to people you know, who will deny some truth in the Bible, and they'll deny that truth in the Bible by saying, well, we just don't understand how it works. <laughs> no, you don't get away with that. The Bible has revealed this to be true. You're to believe it. And you're to exhaust yourself in attempting to understand, digest, and submerse yourself in all that God has revealed. You can't just ignore teaching in the Bible and say, well, it's just so difficult for us. to No, do the work. Understand as much as has been revealed to you and you're responsible for what has been revealed to you. But there are many things in the Bible revealed that we don't understand. And listen, that's okay. Get used to it. <laughs> Get used to it. God sometimes simply reveals truth and says, believe it. God sometimes simply reveals truth and says, obey it. Even though we don't always understand it. I do not know how God works through, above, and even beyond all of our free choices and actions to bring about or to perfectly accomplish His decreed will. I don't know how God does that. I may not know how He does it, but I do know that He does it. And how do we know that? Because that's exactly what the Bible reveals. This is the doctrine of concurrence, the doctrine of God's providence. For another example, turn with me to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and let's look at another example of secondary causes or instrumental means from 1 Samuel chapter 2 in the account of Eli and his two wicked sons. This is the doctrine of God's providence. 1 Samuel chapter 2, look down beginning at verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22. Now Eli, Eli is serving as a priest here. Eli was very old. And he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, at the door of the worship place. And you know what we're talking about here. Verse 23, so he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. It's amazing that Eli has to hear about this from others. He doesn't himself know 
what's going on with his two wicked sons. And here, all this warrants from Eli, apparently in Eli's heart and mind, is just a verbal rebuke. Why are you doing such things? This is serious business, right? He said to them, why do you do such things? I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. Now notice first, notice first with me, the two sons of Eli are wicked men. They're wicked men. They'd become a scourge to the children of Israel, a plague on worship in Israel. They caused Israel to despise the offerings. And notice, God didn't work in their heart to make them evil. They were sinful by nature. There's a heresy that's called equal ultimacy. God's providence, a biblical understanding of God's providence, does not mean that God goes into the heart of an otherwise neutral man and works in his heart to make him do evil things to bring about his judgment upon him. Right? God doesn't work that way. That's a heresy called equal ultimacy. This is not equal ultimacy. This is not God working in their heart to make them evil, working in their heart to make them do evil things. They were sinful by nature. Right? They're wicked men, sinful by nature, acting in accord with their sinful natures. Now listen, uh, you might identify yourself with very ca- various characters in the Bible. You might read a, a story like this and say, well, you know, I'm like Samuel. <laughs> or I'm like, maybe you think I'm like Eli. Listen, before Jesus Christ, you are a wicked son of Eli. You're just like one of these wicked sons. By nature, children of wrath. By nature, sons of disobedient. By nature, someone God has plans for. And listen to the plans that God has for them. They're responsible. These two wicked sons are responsible and accountable for their free sinful actions. Verse 25. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, listen, they did not heed the voice of their father. Why? Because the Lord desired to kill them. That's interesting. It's worded that way intentionally by the Spirit of God. Notice the order. It does not say the Lord desired to kill them because they did not heed the voice of their father. But rather, it says, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. This is the working of God's providence. The order speaks to cause and effect. Cause and effect. Their disobedience is the effect. What is the cause of their disobedience? Ultimately, you could say the Lord's determination to kill them. There are secondary causes here. The Lord works through means, works through instrumental means, secondary causes to bring about His purpose, their own sin nature, their own sinful inclinations, their own sinful, wicked heart. In other words, the Lord works through means or secondary causes to accomplish His will. This is the work of His providence. The means by which the Lord would carry out His will pertaining to these two men would be their disobedience to their father. That's the means through which God was at work to bring about His decreed ends concerning them. Do you see? God determined the end... And God determined the means or the instrumental cause. And the two wicked sons of Eli acted freely. They made their own choices, their own decisions in accord with their own sinful nature. And they were held responsible for their actions. So think about this account together, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Let me ask you, did God have to reach into their heart, and do anything to make them disobey. Did God have to do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why? Because the two wicked sons of Eli were totally depraved. They were depraved. Depraved in heart and mind. And the only restraint to the free reign of their depravity is, brother and sister, the only, the very same restraint that is operative in your heart and in my heart to restrain our sinful inclinations, and that is the restraining hand of God. The only restraint 
upon the two wicked sons of Eli, upon their depravity, upon giving free reign to their depravity, is the restraining hand of a gracious God who is working all things according to the counsel of His own will. The restraining hand of God. Did God have to provoke them to evil? No, God did not. He merely needed to remove the restraint. Do you see? He merely needed to remove any restraint on their corrupt nature and the two wicked sons of Eli acted in accord with their wicked nature and did what they were naturally predisposed to do. It's interesting in the Bible. Uh, there are many examples of this. Uh, one is where God, it says, hardened the heart of Pharaoh. The Bible clearly says that. That God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, what did God do to harden Pharaoh's heart? Did God reach into the heart of Pharaoh and implant there sin and wickedness and desire to do evil? No, God doesn't have to do that. God doesn't have to do that. In order for Pharaoh's heart to be further hardened, what did God merely have to do? God merely had to withhold his restraining hand, remove the restraint. Remove the restraint, and Pharaoh's heart became harder and harder and harder and harder. All that is necessary is the removal of his gracious restraint, and it, that removal gives free reign to our lusts. Free reign to our sinful inclinations. Free reign to our depraved nature to do that which is natural to depraved men and women, right? Boys and girls. That removal, if you think about it, when God removes His hand that way, that's already a judgment of God against their wickedness. Do you see? Romans 1 speaks of it this way. Romans 1 speaks of it as God giving them up to the uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. Giving them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts. Does God have to go and implant uncleanness? <laughs> no. There is uncleanness that would take free reign in our hearts had it not been for the restraining hand of a gracious God. He just gives them up to it. Gives them up to their natural inclinations. It says there in Romans 1 that He gave them up to vile passions. He gives them up. God gave them up to a debased mind. He merely gives them up. What does He do? He removes the restraint. He removes His gracious restraining hand. Sometimes... God works apart from secondary causes or apart from instrumental means. And we call those actions of God miracles. When God doesn't work through secondary causes, when He doesn't work through instrumental means, and He goes uh, against, you could say, uh, the order that He's established in that sense and operates uh, miraculously, right? It's often that this world will see miracles in the Bible and they'll seek to find secondary causes or instrumental means that are outside the control and hand of God to explain them away, right? It's not the Red Sea with water towering over Pharaoh and his armies. It's the Reed Sea, the Reed Sea, and it's just calf deep, right? And the wind blew and spread, spread the water apart so they could go across. It's absurd, right? The world looking at secondary causes and trying to replace God with those secondary causes. God is providential over even secondary causes. God is providential over instrumental causes, instrumental means, and God is providential over all of it. God's providence extends over all things, even the wicked actions of sinful men. Even over the free actions, even over the free, supposedly free decisions of men, and even when those free acts and decisions are sinful. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. It's amazing. You plan your way, the Lord directs your steps. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. If you think about it, Proverbs 16, a, man, a man's heart plans his way, the Lord directs his steps. Speaking of the doctrine of concurrence, right? We could think of that way, of that passage. The doctrine of concurrence, there's a convergence, you could say, of two rivers in that passage. Proverbs 19, 21. There are many plans in a man's heart, Nevertheless, despite those plans, the Lord's counsel, that's what will stand. A man may think he's accomplishing his own will. He's actually accomplishing the decreed will of God. Proverbs 20, 24, a man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own way? How can he understand his own way? 
It's the mystery of God's providence. A great mystery we don't understand. The world tends to think of these things as historical accidents. Not so. When you begin to understand this, you begin to see the invisible hand of God in your life. God at work through providence. Not that we are, uh, can interpret God's will by looking at providence. It's often the case that we absolutely cannot, and it's unwise to try to do so. But God is at work. We can certainly see God's providence, for example, directing the affairs of this church. If you've been here for any length of time, what God has done in this church is absolutely amazing. Like, amazing. God's providence. It is amazing what God has done. And the you know, you look back, we tend to look at providence in the rearview mirror, and you look back at all of the, the things that God has done. And you can look at each one and say, yeah, that, that was God that did that. Yep, and that was God that did that. There's no other explanation but that God did that, and God did all these things. And, you know, it is absolutely, stunningly, staggeringly amazing. The church plants that we've been a part of here, to know those stories, to see how God worked in those circumstances, absolutely amazing. That is God at work through His providence, bringing about His decreed end and purposes. What about your own life? What about your own life? Can you see God's good providence at work in your own life? I could give you one example. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have never turned from your sin. You're still living for yourself. But you, you, are the ruler of your own life. That's the way that you're living. You're in your sin and loving it. Then it's God's kind, compassionate providence at work that you're here today. Have an opportunity to hear the gospel preached. Have an opportunity to hear what the Lord has to say about you, your condition, where you will end up, and what He has done to provide for sin. God's providence, right? Ruth could see it in her life. right? Just read about Ruth. Absolutely amazing. Naomi tried to interpret God's, how God related to her by looking at providence. And Naomi said, call me Mara, bitterness, because God, God obviously hates me, right? Job thought that God hated him, treating him that way. We can't understand God's relatedness to us through providence. We just have to trust him, trust him. But we see God's providence at work in Ruth's life. We see providence, God's work of providence in Naomi's life, in Job's life, in Esther, Esther's life, right? And these are not extraordinary circumstances. These are not extenuating circumstances. This is how God works in the world, in every circumstance. This is how God commonly works in every aspect of His created order. We reason, we choose, we desire, we act, and God is there, sovereign over it all. The tragic reality of our fall into sin is that apart from a work of God to create us anew in Christ, our reasoning and choosing and desiring and acting are all against the revealed will of God in His Word. He demands holiness in our inward parts. He demands a love for Him above all. And we are incapable apart from His grace to do it. We're free to reason free to choose, free to desire, free to act. We're free to do what we want, so to speak. And that's the problem because we have a sin nature and we're enslaved to our sin nature. We're in bondage to our sin nature. And when we do what we want, we sin. We desperately need to be set free from that. We desperately need to be set free from sin and death. The only way that happens is by the working of His Spirit and there's no concurrence involved in that work. No concurrence. God alone changes my heart. God alone causes me to be born again. He changes the disposition of my nature. And God makes me a new creation in Christ. Those things which were natural to my fallen condition are natural no more. That which is natural to me changes in accord with my new heart. When God changes my nature, then that which is natural to me also changes. Do you see? In Christ then, we love the Lord. 
We love His Word. We hate our sin. But what changed? What changed? Your heart changed. <laughs> Your affections changed. Who changed them? <laughs> the Lord changed them. God changed them. I didn't do it. Did you choose then? Let me ask you. Did you choose... Did you choose to turn from sin and to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course you did. Of course you chose. You chose to repent. You chose to believe. Of course you chose. Why did you choose? Why did you choose to turn from sin and to trust in Jesus Christ? Why? Because you wanted to. You wanted to be free from sin. You wanted to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You wanted to be forgiven. You wanted eternal life. You wanted to worship Him. Why did you do it? Because you wanted to do it. But you didn't do it in accord with your old sin nature. That would be impossible. You didn't do it in accord with your old sin nature. If you truly turn, it's because God made you alive in Jesus Christ. That's why you did it. From dead, from being dead in trespasses and sin, God made you alive in Christ, and now you want to. And so you do. He made you alive, and then you wanted to. And then you chose. You chose to believe, and you chose to repent, and you chose to follow Him. Love and affection for the Lord Jesus Christ is not natural to fallen men. It's not natural to fallen men. By nature... Apart from Christ, you're a child of wrath, a son of disobedience. But now things have changed. Now things have changed and Christ is precious to you. Why is that? Why is that? Because of His kind providence toward us. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. That's why the Lord says, listen, I didn't, you didn't choose me. I chose you. It's absurd to think of it any other way. We love Him because He first loved us. Works the other way too, just so you know. Why are you not a Christian? Well, it's because you refuse to repent and believe. You refuse. You're willful in your refusal. You're willful in your rejection. You refuse to repent and believe. You are morally responsible for that wicked choice and you will, hold, you will be held to account. There is a day on which God will judge the world in righteousness. So, a lesson then. A lesson considering these things. What is then the primary cause? Think of cause, right? Causality. What is the primary cause of your salvation? It is the work of God alone. The primary cause of your salvation is the work of God alone. What is a secondary cause? Or what is an instrumental means by which you are saved or through which you are saved? My repentant faith. I repent and I believe. It is a means through which God justifies the instrumental means of faith. Because it comes as a fruit of our new nature, it's considered a gift of God. But it is a, an instrumental means. God in His providence works in and through both primary and secondary or instrumental causes necessary to bring about His decreed will. And those secondary causes are free. They're free in the sense that those agents performing secondary causes are uncoerced. They're not like string, you know, Pinocchio <laughs> or a robot. They're uncoerced, and the examples of this are numerous. We simply don't have time to get into many of them today. Consider, and I encourage you to take a look at this on your own time. One example in Acts 27 is very compelling, very interesting. In Acts 27, if you remember, Paul is a prisoner, and he's on his way to Rome by ship. They put Paul and a bunch of other people on this ship, and they're headed to Rome, where Paul is going to uh, go before uh, trial in Rome. On their way, the seas become exceedingly rough. It's a bad time of year to be traveling, and they begin to fear for their lives. 
They believe they're going to drown to death. The ship is going to be shipwrecked. They're not going to make it. It's at that time that an angel from God comes and tells Paul that they're all going to be saved. God decrees, God says to Paul, you're going to be saved. You're going to be saved. Now, if you remember the account, that's the word of God. That will come to pass. God is going to save those on the ship. Well, they start making provisions to navigate through the storm, right? They start throwing cargo overboard. They do what they are supposed to do. All of those are secondary causes or they are instrumental means by which the ship is saved. You see, you can't say to yourself, right? um, Listen, I trust God. And if God wants to kill me, he can kill me. So I'm not going to wear my (laughs) seatbelt. No, God uses instrumental causes, instrumental means, secondary causes. It may very well be that the instrumental cause of your death is not wearing your seatbelt, you foolish person. Put your seatbelt on, right? God uses secondary causes, instrumental means. One of the instrumental means or secondary causes that God uses to bring about his decreed will to save the people on the ship is that they begin throwing cargo overboard. They begin taking steps to preserve the ship, right? In the process of this preservation, there are many who decide they're going to sneak around front, drop a skiff down, and get off the boat and row to shore. Right? They say that's the way we're going to do things. In other words, not trusting in God's word, right? God's revealed word. God's going to save the ship. I'm not going to trust in that. I'm going to go or drop the skiff down, get on the skiff, go to the shore. Paul, in the midst of this, introduces a contingency. And I want us to understand this little aspect of providence also, right? Paul says to them, listen, if you get off the boat, you cannot be saved. He introduces a condition. Does that contingency undermine God's decreed will in the situation? No, it doesn't undermine it. It supports it. How does it support it? That contingency supports it by keeping the guys on the boat, <laughs> right? Keeping the guys on the boat. The warning is real. The contingency is real. If they got off the boat, they're going to die. It's all real, but God uses that contingency to bring about his desired purpose. I've thought about it many times with respect to warning passages in Hebrews. For example, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, right? Having been enlightened, right? Having tasted of the spirit of the, the age, the heavenly powers, the good gifts, and blowing the quoting of that. But um, if you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's impossible now if you turn away to renew them again to repentance. And what's left for them is this fearful expectation of judgment. That is a contingency. It's very real. That's not just merely hypothetical. That is a real contingency. But it's a contingency meant to bring about the accomplishment of God's will. It's meant to keep you, believer, fearing sin and trusting in the Lord by clinging closely to Him. Do you see how that works? That's, again, that's a work of God's providence. How God works through secondary causes or instrumental means to bring about his decreed and purposed end. Paul says, if you get off the boat, you cannot be saved. Paul wasn't undermining the promise of God. That warning was a means of them staying in the boat. Warning was real. The secondary cause, a contingency, which was instrumental in God accomplishing his purpose concerning them was real. God's will doesn't do away with secondary causes or contingencies. God's will actually establishes. God's providence actually establishes secondary causes, instrumental means, contingencies like this one. In other words, in other words, my actions as second causes or as instrumental means have significance. I'm not just a pawn. I'm acting, I'm deciding, I'm choosing, I'm living. And our actions, our thoughts, our lives have significance as instrumental means. In other words, typical um, absurd and foolish objection to God's sovereignty as understood by the doctrines of grace is that then why evangelize? Why would you ever evangelize? Because if God's going to save them, He's going to save them. No need for you to go, right? It's foolish. If you believe that, then why would you ever evangelize? Listen, we evangelize because we believe that. If you believe that, God works through secondary causes and instrumentality. I'm an instrument by which God is accomplishing His means, His ends, His purposes, His plans. I'm a means by which He does that. That 
motivates me, fuels me to go out and obey Him, right? And, and I want to be a part of that. It's like um, to William Carey that went to China, right? And William Carey was going to China and um, old curmudgeon guy in their church, you know, if the, if the Lord wanted to save those heathen, He could do it without your help. <laughs> How absurd. William Carey saw lost people in China became burdened. He wanted to go preach the gospel to them that they might be saved. And God used William Carey as a means to save thousands. There were missionaries upon missionaries upon missionaries who have followed William Carey onto the mission field to preach the gospel to lost sinners that they might be saved. The missionary work that we see done today in large part, right, is following the example of William Carey. Our church planting efforts, following the example of William Carey, following the instruction given us in God's Word, God says, go and preach the gospel to every creature. God, the way that God works in providence actually establishes instrumental means, secondary causes. Why preach if He doesn't? Why preach? God wants to apply His Word to you. He can do it without... Somebody like me. <laughs> he does it mostly without me anyway. <laughs> no, it's God uses secondary means, secondary causes. He uses instrumentality. Why pray? Why pray? If you don't believe that your prayers mean anything, that God works through your prayers to bring about His decreed ends, why study? There's so many other examples, right? So many examples in Scripture. This is how God works in the world. Where do we fit in this understanding? Bear with me for just a moment. Where do we fit into this understanding? Most believe themselves to be the end for which God exists. All God's plans, all God's purposes terminate in me, pertain to me. I am the end, my happiness, my fulfillment. He has a wonderful plan for my life and it's God's job to make sure that happens. Like a rose trampled on the ground, he took the fall and thought of me above all. When in reality, in reality, we are a means to his ends. We're a means to his ends. In his providence, we are a secondary cause. We are an instrumentality. You do not exist for your own ends. You exist for his ends. For from him and through Him and to Him are all things, including you, including me. God has a right to do with me as He pleases. God has a right to do with you as He pleases. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, For us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live for Him, right? If you meditate on that, that will change how you view the world, change how you view life, it will change how you think, change how you live, change how you serve the Lord, change how you pray, change how you worship, right? Change how you exalt in Him. I'm not an end, I am a means to His ends, and whatever my God ordains is right. That brings us to Romans chapter 8. Listen to this in verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Listen. And we know, not simply believe, not simply think, not simply hope, we know that all things, not some things, not most things, not just the things we want, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. That is a tremendous promise. And it is intensely practical. Intensely practical. Why? Because those whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, those whom He predestined, these He also called. Those whom He called, these he also justified. Those whom he justified, these he also glorified. There's an unbroken chain of God accomplishing his purposes for you. God will, through his providence, bring about his 
promised ends. So, Paul asked the question then, what are we to say to these things? What are we to say to these? That is like uh, this, this glorious truth. What then shall we say to these things? This, if God is for us, then who can be against us? God for us. God's for us. Who can be against us? What exists that could be against us if God is for us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies us. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Furthermore, he's also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is tribulation going to do it? Absolutely not. Tribulation is God's good providence toward us, which we often see in the rearview mirror as exactly what we needed, was exactly for our good. And we look at all that God accomplished through it and we're comforted comforted, and our faith is bolstered and we trust Him more and we thank Him, we're grateful for it, right? Is distress going to do it? Is persecution going to do it? Famine? Nakedness? Peril? Sword? Listen, there's nothing that's going to do it. As it is written, Paul says, for your sake, we're killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. They've already conquered. I've already conquered in Christ, right? Christ is the one who has conquered. I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. In other words, nothing, right? Not height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. A biblical understanding of God's providence is comforting. It is empowering. It is emboldening. It is faith-fueling. It is motivating. It is height of foolishness to worry. Isn't it? To complain... So much more could be said. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who holds us in his sovereign hands. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Take a moment. Thank the Lord. Ask him to apply this understanding. Help us, Lord, to understand these things more clearly from your word. And then when you're done praying, we'll pray together and we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we we thank you for your perfect will. Thank you, Lord, for who you are for what you've done. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ. Thank you for providing the sacrifice for sin. Thank you for forgiving us in Him. Thank you for uniting us to Him. Thank you for adopting us in Him. Uh, Thank you for the inheritance we have in Him. Lord, thank you for these glorious, glorious blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the, the smiling, precious, and gracious, merciful work of your providence toward us in Him working all things together for good. What a tremendous blessing. We've seen that time and time and time and time and time again in our own lives, Lord, and we just in awe of you and how you do these things. We don't understand, Lord, but we know that you do. Your word reveals that you do, and we're grateful. We lay hold of those precious truths, and we worship you and praise you for them. And be with us, Lord, as we grow in our faith, grow us, Lord, mature us, help us to understand these things and help us to not to worry, Lord, and help us to stop complaining and help us, Lord, to trust you, help us to rely on you, to rest in you, help us to be comforted by these truths and strengthened by these truths and emboldened by them and motivated by them and fuel our worship, fuel our praise, fuel our faith and Further conform us, Lord, into the image of your Son who trusted you perfectly in all things. That you may be glorified, and that you may be worshipped, and that we may be like him, our Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who's never turned from their sin to trust you, Lord, that you would save them. Or that you would bring about good in that respect toward them. I pray that they would not be obstinate in their sin and rebellion against you but would see how they've offended you and would turn to the blessed Savior. 
And I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here at this church, Lord, that you would um, mature us in our faith, our precious faith, and help us, Lord, to be more faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ um, for our own good, for your glory, as a testimony of this lost and dying world. I pray that we'd be fervent in obeying you, knowing that we are but means, or that you graciously use to bring about your decreed ends and help us to be in awe and wonder of that reality that we are used of you in that way and rejoice to be means uh, to that end um, because it brings glory to you and help us, Lord, to be faithful in doing that. We can't do any of this in our own strength. Spirit of God, we ask that you would uh, cause us to walk in your statutes and judgments and to do them. All these things we pray in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen.